welcome to Fandom 101, where we take a look at what fandom is, what its aspects are, and what issues exist today in the fan community. Did you know that shows like The Mandalorian and Doctor Who are filmed in front of digital sets? It's part of a filming technique called virtual production, where sets are created digitally and then shown on large LED screens behind the actors. As virtual production becomes more popular in Hollywood, it's often used to film sci-fi and fantasy shows, as game engines allow fantastical worlds to be built with ease. Today we're talking with two virtual production professionals, Matteo Filippi and Urosh Perisic, to learn more. Uh, thank you, Matteo, for being here today. Thanks for having me. All right, so could you start by like introducing yourself and your work and how you're involved with virtual production? Sure. Um, I started in the music industry. Uh, I have a degree in music, I, and I got involved in the recording industry uh, many years ago, back in the 90s. I made a lot of money with hip-hop. And then the industry changed through Napster, and I went into live events. And from live events and music, I realized that corporate events paid more. So I got very involved in corporate events as an audio engineer primarily. Uh, and then once I started doing corporate events, I realized that video, for every audio job, there were four video jobs. So I, I got myself trained through mentorship, through taking coursework, and started learning video production. And um, about eight, nine years ago, MIT uh, started using Zoom, before Zoom was a thing, <laughs> in, in integrating uh, uh, classrooms into a hybrid uh, type classroom and virtual classrooms and it really piqued my interest in virtual production so I started dabbling a lot more in virtual uh, software some video production software doing a lot of editing creating video content for corporations and um, corporations uh, also caught the wave and uh, be besides using the virtual background for incorporating guests and attendees at their events, which was necessary in 2020, they, their insatiable desire to create a movie-like atmosphere in their corporate productions, both live and virtual, uh, became a driving force for uh, a niche part of our industry. And I kind of found myself in the middle of that, doing about 60% audio, about 30% video. Overall, I have like about 16 years of experience in the industry in animation and visual effects. I worked in uh, various different production studios, animation studios in New York City for 15 years, after which I moved to Boston. Uh, worked there around for five years, and now I'm uh, in Florida and uh, working remotely, embracing the, uh, the remote workforce um, story narrative. And um, But yeah, I've been involved in virtual production for the last... Um, Let's say three or four years actively, and we primarily shoot it, shoot or film in uh, New Hampshire, in a studio called um, Studio Lab, mm -hmm. and uh, that is in Derry, New Hampshire, and uh, that being the closest studio in the Boston area from where we we used to do productions. And um, but in terms of vid virtual production, yeah, so that is basically video production in a studio environment where you do have full control of every aspect of the production in sense of lighting, positioning, camera, uh, environment. And uh, a lot of producers find this a uh, favorable way of shooting or filming rather uh, because you can change the environment in a split second and um, you do not have to relight or set up each shot, which speeds up production quite a lot. What is your the favorite and least favorite part of your job, say, like on an average fancy corporate event set? The least favorite part of my job would be sitting there with a ro robotic camera stationary in front of someone behind a desk talking at a screen. Hmm. I have a hard time staying awake <laughs> with a lot of those events. Um, the most exciting is really in pre-production and post-production. Um, where you're creating content to be done in a live situation and uh, being able to problem solve. I thrive on problem solving. I thrive on looking at a space, a blank space, and thinking of how we can create a visual background and an audio background that'll work for whatever genre we're using. So. And what was your favorite project to work on? My favorite project, you'll laugh if I tell you, but it's very simple. 
during the pandemic, a lot of AV companies, a lot of virtual companies just went, uh, virtual companies started popping up, but AV companies and production companies just kind of went kaput. Mm -hmm. And I had all this equipment. What am I going to do with this equipment? I didn't want to, if I could, take money from the government, take unemployment. So I created a virtual integrated approach to funerals. <laughs> it sounds funny, but for me it's about re reward here. Mm -hmm. And creating a virtual background and a virtual element where people could attend from around the world because they couldn't travel and make them feel like they were part of what was going on in the space. That's a challenge for a big corporate event as well as a small group of people that wanted to connect. Mm -hmm. And for me, anything that involves connecting people on a, in a virtual space uh, is rewarding for me because there's always a separation, it seems. And when we can achieve that connection, that's what becomes rewarding. It's more of a heart answer than it is a technical answer, but that's what drives me. Yeah, and I totally understand, like, part of the nastiness of COVID, of mm -hmm. people not being able to grieve their losses properly. So I'm glad that you were able to help them out in that well, regard. By doing that, I didn't have to take any money. All my bills were met. Uh, I, I approached a number of funeral homes, showed them what I could do, um, and priced it within the market that I thought would work. Some AV companies tried to do the same thing virtually, and it didn't quite work out. They were treating it like a corporate event, and their price margin was so high, the average family couldn't afford it. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I really succeeded in that area, and I still get asked by some of these funeral homes to connect. Um, it's not fancy, um, but it really integrates the virtual world with the real world connecting those two. What was your favorite virtual production to shoot? Uh, favorite so far has been this uh, brand video we did for for this um, uh, enterprise company. And uh, we used a, a robotic arm that had a camera mounted on it. And uh, it was moving around the talent uh, in a virtual production environment where the background was basically moving according to the camera position and uh, we had tremendous control over the the motion of the camera and uh, getting that exact vantage point that uh, that we needed but the also the the big addition to the overall whole pro process is that the ability to grab the 3d coordinate data from the camera and then use it later on in, in the 3D software to add, you know, VFX or any other additional 3D elements that, that we needed in the scene. I'm always impressed by how the virtual production set after it's built in a game engine is synced with cameras so that as the camera moves, the set moves as well. And that's really, I think that's really cool personally. I do have some clips that I'd like to show you of various sure. virtual productions just to see if you've done something similar. So if you could start by playing the Doctor Who clip again. So this was for the episode Boom in the most recent season. Mm -hmm. um, have you worked on a kind of show like this? Yeah. Um, one of the companies locally that uh, I've worked with, oftentimes, you'll, and many of you may have seen uh, elements on YouTube or, or, or some virtual productions where you have this big curved uh, virtual wall, this LED wall. And the, the curved wall creates a sense of depth. Uh, and uh, we, we did a lot of commercials, believe it or not, with that kind of a setup uh, for Hasbro. And uh, we had to set up a 100-foot curved wall uh, in, in the studio. And um, being able to create a virtual space for commercials. Uh, it's, it's the same technology. You can see um, they did have the fire effects in the foreground and also the stuff sure. in the background. Um, I'm, the stuff in the background I'm understanding is just like the setup in the foreground is interesting because you have to make this whole dirt and fire and rocks kind of thing. You know, the thing that gets really challenging in a space like that, because it's a very controlled environment, is to create an audio space, which is probably uh, um, more what I did in some of those instances uh, when doing film. 
and creating an audio space that's realistic that brings you into that area. Because if you have a dead space and you have a virtual background like that and you have dead audio, <laughs> it, something doesn't click. Yeah. So you have to find creative ways. Mic placement is huge. Uh, being able to eliminate ambient noise in a room is huge. Um, a technique we call room tone, we, we were speaking about earlier, where you record the room with every, all the set pieces in place, all the people in place that are recording, all the machinery on, the ambient hums of lights and machines. And you record about two or three minutes of room tone. So when you come out of that and go into post-production, you invert that audio signal and it d eliminates all the ambient noise that's in the room and it gives you a blank slate to be able to create reverbs, wind, um, background noises that you have to put in different spaces. You know, when you're working with surround sound, taking a space like that, mic placement can help a little bit, but you need to be able to create a virtual space of surround sound uh, with five speakers or seven speakers and know where those sounds are in relation to the images that you're seeing. All right. Yeah, it's really cool how you can just invert the sound and use it to like mute the room tone and then put other sounds on top of that. That's sure. pretty cool. There's also another technique that's used in film when it comes to room tone. When you take room tone um, and you're taking a dialogue between people, between characters in a film, as they speak to each other, uh, there comes a point in time in post-production where you're cutting and pasting things. Yeah. And it gets really abrupt. Mm -hmm. Having room tone underneath it covers up that abrupt cut that you would have because with those cuts comes room tone. Mm -hmm. But if you have another track of room tone underneath it, it creates a, a more lively space that you don't hear those cuts, you don't hear the splicing, that, virtual splicing that takes place. If someone came up to you who was interested in getting into virtual production but wasn't sure how, um, what advice would you give? Like everything else in baby steps, you know, um, I think the first step is uh, figuring out the 3D software that uh, you would use in order to generate your model and uh, texture it, light it, prep it, and uh, minimize the geometry so that once it's imported into, into the Unreal Engine, um, that it is as light as possible so that the engine uh, doesn't have any problems uh, processing all that information. And um, but, uh, but yeah, tinkering is the best way to learn, I, uh, especially in this uh, very, very new uh, industry. And uh, you can easily create virtual sets and environments just using your computer monitor and, uh, and, and, mini and creating miniature productions, let's say, uh, using your iPhone and uh, to film and your monitor as the backdrop. These are very, very useful tests because Basically, all the mechanics are there, and uh, once you overcome that, uh, let's say, as a stepping stone, then uh, you can easily kind of bubble, bubble up and work on a regular size production in a, in a regular studio. You did mention um, filming stuff with your phone for to make a virtual, your own virtual set. Um, is that built into the iPhone, or would you need a specific app to kind of scan the environment? Yeah, great question. So um, there is an app that uh, Unreal is made for specifically for the iPhone that turns your phone into a virtual camera hmm. that pair that pairs with the Unreal environment uh, that you are filming in, inside of. And um, the position you you have to obviously tell it what the parameters are and how big how big the scene is. But once that is done, then the position of your of your iPhone in relation to the monitor also moves the backdrop and the environment that you're in so that you can easily film whatever you need. Okay, and what's the name of that app if people are interested in seeing it? Oh, uh, I have to look it up, but uh, let's see. Unreal VCam. Okay, cool. I'll have to yeah. learn more about that um, in the future. Currently, most virtual production sets are built in game engines like Unreal or Unity, but are there any other softwares or engines you've seen used to build sets? Well, Unreal is sort of a driving force, and, it's, and, and that's really the only one that I've really worked with in this kind of capacity. But there are a lot of other softwares that integrate with Unreal. Um, uh, of course, Blender, if you're using that to drive your video walls. Uh, Chiron uh, and uh, VSAR 
came out with a new update recently where you can create your own virtual backgrounds that's just absolutely pristine. Some of the virtual backgrounds become so perfect that you kind of have to dumb them down to mm. fit <laughs> what you want it to fit in terms so of the space. So you have the background in the uncanny valley by accident. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? It, yeah, you have, to, you have to dumb things down a little bit to make it more realistic. But uh, yeah. it, it's unbelievable what AI can do. Um, AI, there, there are so many different um, software integration with AI. One of the companies that I work regularly for is a company called In Inner Systems that started out as a small little office in Cambridge next to MIT and they were working on integrating technology uh, solutions for companies and they eventually evolved into incorporating AI. That's their drive. Now they're the number one tenant in the State Street Bank building in uh, Boston which is looks like a giant sale and a lot of corporations because of their insatiable desire to have this movie sense in their productions they have virtual production studios in their office spaces uh, I think they have four three or four virtual production studios I go over there pretty regularly with them to create um, intro videos and demonstration videos for their clients and uh, we're beginning to use AI in that and it's uh, it's fascinating it's fascinating to see I've been researching various different um, animation and virtual production apps um, some programs are free but others are pretty expensive I think cinema 40 is like cinema over two thousand dollars a year yeah it's like <laughs> yeah you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering, besides like Blender and uh, Unreal, what free or low cost software would you recommend? Well, if you're talking about phones and, and tablets, I don't usually work with phones and tablets in the work that I do, mm -hmm. uh, other than controlling devices. Um, and uh, Blender kind of in integrates into tablets for controlling devices. Uh, but uh, in, with, with phones and tablets, it's usually laptops or, or PCs or, or Macs. So in your daily work, what's your favorite and least favorite part of your job? My favorite part of my job is tinkering with new tech. And uh, now with uh, AI and uh, the game engines kind of really taking over a lot of the workflows that we're, we've been used to. My favorite part is trying to integrate um, more and more AI generation into on the Unreal Engine or any other workflow that I'm doing, right? So, but my favorite, my favorite overall is prepping models and animating inside of 3D software and getting them ready for, for Unreal let's say. Oh, and my right. least favorite is, I guess, when stuff doesn't work, and then you just have to figure out what is going on, and then just going down the pipeline and eliminating one thing after another, just to find out that it was this radial button as a sub menu that you just need to uncheck, and then all of a sudden, mm. everything works. So. Yeah, seems like there's a lot of points where stuff could go wrong. So always have to yes. Fix it in pre, I think, is the saying, to make sure that nothing goes wrong during the show, that everything is tested and all bugs fixed before you actually shoot. From the content and, uh, let's say, story standpoint, yes. But when you're, uh, when you're in the production, in the virtual production environment, and uh, when you have, you know, three, four Unreal Engines going and you you are the the wall in the back is lit up and everything is going and then all of a sudden something stops oh. there's no way of to preempt that right so and that these are the kind of problems that um that we constantly have to deal with but it's new, it's a new technology and but so it's to be expected pretty much so how do you see the virtual production industry developing over the next few years well Technologically, there'll obviously be a lot of advancements, but I think overall, the big thrust, both in the corporate world and in, in the entertainment industry, uh, movie production, um, involving the viewer through VR, through other elements of AI, uh, into the scene, I think is where things will eventually move. Um, if you can imagine, instead of watching a movie on a screen, you'll actually be through VR walking into 
the scene itself and becoming part of the movie as a character or at least an observer on the ground up close and personal which um, I think is what is going to drive the industry after the hype of ooh, we got AI here and I think we're kind of at that pinnacle now with AI we're running into a lot of problems with uh, copyright we're running into issues that are going to have to have some legal elements involved with it and in terms of investments I, I, I do so much work in the corporate world I'm constantly hearing about investments in AI and it's at the point where it's um, almost not profitable to invest in them uh, right now because they are at the top of the bell curve in terms of investing at least in 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 the the more uh, mainstream uh, AI in, in implementations uh, some of the new technologies about v with involving VR and gaming they're probably the hot button to invest in right now because that's where I think the industry is going to move more into. How do you see virtual production developing as an industry in the next few years? Well, I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to balloon, I feel like, uh, especially, as I mentioned, with the AI generation and AI integration into pretty much every single software that that we use every day. Um, and as that gets more more robust and uh, the API is a little bit more dependable, we can kind of see those two kind of fusing together. And, um, you know, if I'm in a virtual production environment and as a director, I don't like a corner where my, my talent's standing, I can easily prompt up and say that I want to have a, I don't know, a bar over her shoulder and a, and a bartender that's pouring a drink. And then just as an instant, in, in an instant, it will be there. So, and mm -hmm. those kind of things are, are something that I think that all of the technology uh, innovators are kind of looking forward to integrating into the, into the pipeline. Is there anything else you'd like to share? I think, well, the only thing I'd add is um, if you'd like to learn more about virtual production, Netflix just came out with a uh, video series. I did not know the name of it, but it's specifically about virtual production methodologies. Mm -hmm. um, and it is on YouTube, I believe. So if you search Netflix virtual production methodologies, I'm sure it'll show up. That's about all the time we have today. Um, where can we find you online? One of the difficulties about doing corporate is that you sign non-disclosures all the time because mm -hmm. all their stuff is proprietary. Mm -hmm. So unless you're in those corporate worlds, you probably won't see a lot of it. But you can find, I do post some things that I do on LinkedIn. So you can find me, uh, uh, Matteo Filippi, on LinkedIn, and I post a lot of uh, audio uh, um, posts and, and video posts uh, in there about things that I'm doing as I'm doing them, as l and within the confines of my non-disclosures that I have to <laughs> sign. Yeah, got to keep the co uh, companies yeah. happy. Absolutely. Yeah, well, thank you for joining us, Matteo. It was great to talk to you. Thank you for having me. Yes, so I'm a creative director and partner of a uh, an agency, digital agency called Deep Vibe. And if you go to deepvibe.com, uh, you will see all of our work and all about us. All right. Well, thank you for coming, Arosh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us to learn about fandom. I hope to see you next time to discuss the ins and outs of fan culture. And remember, never stop being passionate about the things you love. I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.